Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My guest for this evening is Dr. Susan Tracy. She teaches music at Franciscan University. She's here to share her journey of faith. And she'll talk both about her adult conversion to Christ and then also how in her conversion she was drawn home to the Catholic Church. Our theme for tonight is the place of music in our faith. I suppose you could call it music in the gospel. It's a very important part of our history of faith that music has drawn people, it's been used to, for people to express their faith, and it's been used as a way for us to worship God. And we'll talk about different avenues and aspects of music in our lives, in worship, and its place in our, our faith journey. And so I encourage you to start thinking of your questions, not just on the issue of faith, but other questions that may arise as you hear Susan's story. And call us with your questions, if you would, at one 800 Two two one nine four six zero, or you can email us at journeyhome at ewtn dot com. Susan, welcome. Thanks, Marcus. It's really a privilege to be here. <laughs> well, I've looked forward to, to inviting you here. We've uh, I've had a chance to sing Gregorian chant with you <laughs> at Francis <laughs> University a couple times, right. and and uh, I've always thought about having you here, not just to tell your story, but to talk a bit about the place and power and importance of music in our faith. On the one hand, sometimes we take it for granted. Sometimes we don't do too good of a job at, at the music that we sing and maybe don't appreciate it as much. We'll talk a little bit about that. But let's begin, as I always ask the guests, talk a bit about your background, your spiritual journey early in your life. All right. Well, uh, I was baptized at the age of five in a Presbyterian church, and then my family moved back to the next town where we had come from and we started going to the Episcopal <coughs> Church and right in the first grade when we moved I was struck by the liturgy in the mm. Episcopal Church and how beautiful it was mm. and so I I was a faithful churchgoer perfect Sunday school attendance for all those years and then uh, my freshman year of college I continued going to church but that after my freshman year I stopped going to church mm. for maybe a, about 11 years um, during my high school years in Sunday school, Pete, we, our miracles were explained away as uh, supernatural phenomena were explained away as natural things. Uh, and uh, would you and describe your your falling away as kind of the result of bad formation in essence? Possibly, or? yeah, and just the sort of the general yeah. uh, drift of the of society around that time. And and so I came to the feeling that religion was a crutch for people who were too weak to make it on their own. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I was going through adolescent crises and all. And, but uh, during that time, God spoke to me in certain ways, although I didn't always recognize that it was He. <laughs> and uh, then uh, to get to the, to the, uh, the point of conversion, um, a friend took me to uh, an Edgar Cayce study group. Mm. I was reading all kinds of things, and I think I was searching, although I would never have admitted it to myself. <laughs> so we went to this Edgar Cayce study group, and it was so enjoyable. Uh, we read uh, what Who's was Edgar called Casey? Edgar Cayce was an American <clears throat> psychic, and he considered himself to be a Christian. He came from the Disciples of Christ Church, read through the Bible once every year. When he was a young man. He uh, was sitting by a stream one day, and a beautiful lady came to him and told him that he would bring healing to people. So he would go into these trances, and people would ask him questions, and he would prescribe certain things for them to be healed. Uh, and then later on, people started asking questions about the past, and he would bring out things having to do with reincarnation, life at the time of Christ, all kinds of things that we don't know about uh, and so all these things were taken down into books that are called readings and uh, among those were quite a number of scripture passages too and I remember from our meetings particularly the Gospel of John chapters 14 through 17 uh, especially where our Lord says Father may they be one as as you are me and, and I am in you. I may not be quoting it just right. And also in Deuteronomy chapter 30 when Moses says, the word of faith, do not, uh, the word, do not think that you have to go to the heavens to bring it down or to the depths of the sea to bring it up. It is very near to you. It is in your heart. 
And it was that 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 spoke to me and the other passage that made me realize, start to realize that God was perhaps real. And uh, and were these verses that that they kind of base some of their theology on, or were they just ones they used that kind no, of spoke to you? No, he actually, I believe that he actually spoke them out in when he was in the trances. Oh, and then there were other writings around those that were purely okay. things that, that Casey himself said. Right. So we every meeting we would pray the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm, and we would have some group meditation. So then I moved, and I moved to Texas to start graduate school at uh, as it was then North Texas State University. And the first few days I was there, I saw a sign advertising transcendental meditation. Uh-huh. And uh, so I thought, well, I, a student price. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll go and try it. But then I asked myself, I said, well, what makes me think I'll have the discipline to do this if I haven't had the discipline to do this Casey meditation mm-hmm. privately or individually? So I decided to try it out. and. Uh, it, with TM, there's a mantra, but with Casey, uh, you have a, what they call an affirmation. It could be something as brief as, be still and know that I am God, from Psalm 46. Okay. But the one I chose was a rather long one. It was this, not my will, but thine, O Lord, be done in me and through me. Let me ever be a channel of blessings to all I meet in every way. Let my going out and my coming in be in accord with what thou would have me do. And as the call comes, here am I. Send me. Use me. So I sat down and I meditated on that. You're supposed to say it over and then uh, meditate on it. And after a few days, uh, one day, I was doing it. I was filled with this tremendous loving presence. Uh, and, of course, growing up Episcopalian, I was mistrustful of emotionalism. <laughs> so, but I knew it wasn't my emotions. I, I just instantly knew it was God. And... I knew that he loved me as if I were the only person in the world. And I also understood the meaning of the word grace. Mm. And when I was in high school, I re- the church I went to growing up was called Grace Church. And uh, in high school, I looked up the dictionary definition of grace. And I remember how I rankled when I read that we don't deserve God's grace. I remember thinking to myself, how could I not deserve his grace? I've never robbed a bank or killed anyone. But I, I thought, of course I deserve his grace. But when this happened to me, and especially after I, I had really gone so far away in my living and, and in every way, I, I just knew that I didn't deserve it. I understood <laughs> and that it was a free gift. And, and this all seemed to happen in just really just a, a moment. And I knew that I never wanted to be separated from him again. Mm. And I... I, I was drawn to pray every day and to read the Bible. Um, then I also uh, got to meet uh, some wonderful evangelical Christians who challenged my, my beliefs about Edgar Cayce. And <laughs> so I, I sort of took in what they said and they gave me a, a pamphlet um, from InterVarsity Press yeah. about Edgar Cayce and reincarnation. So I read that. and. And, and I went to a Josh McDowell talk, and I thought, yeah, what Josh said made a lot of sense. And I felt that that's what I, what I had experienced. And I, inside myself, I knew that I, I now had a personal relationship mm-hmm. with God, although I experienced him first as Father. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting that even though you were caught up in the Edgar Cayce movement and the TM, that in the midst of that you found a psalm. Mm-hmm. from the scriptures that the Lord used through his grace to get your attention and to open your heart. Right. And it's a beautiful example of how God can reach into any situation and touch someone's heart. I know I am truly amazed because mm-hmm. I think that I, I could still, I was reading all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. I was reading things on unity, Zen Buddhism, macrobiotics, and, you know, yeah. um, yoga. I was really mm-hmm. into a lot of that sort of thing, but little by little, uh, the Lord made me realize the truth and draw, drew me to an understanding of what true Christian doctrine was. In and, response to that <laughs> psalm prayer that you were praying. Yes. And you're <laughs> asking so. him to, in fact, yeah. touch your heart. Yeah. The theme that we've chosen for the program, because of your life's work in music, is going to be the place of music in uh, our faith, in our faith walk, in our lit- liturgy. If you look back on those days, uh, uh, where was music in your own faith 
at that time? Was it a part of your faith? Or was it separate from? Did it, did it come alive with your conversion mm. experience? Well, music was always very important to me. And in my growing up years, I sang in the choir since I was in the fourth grade. And, and so it was uh, so important to me. But then when I began to pursue it as a career, I would have to say that I made music my religion. Hmm. And um, it actually became more important than your childhood faith until you abandoned your childhood faith to focus on your music. Right, I would say <clears throat> so. And then, and then uh, when I came to know the Lord, I, of course, I, I was still involved in music, but music that I had previously known began to take on new meanings for me and things that were there before that I hadn't noticed jumped out at me. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, um, one piece that I had sung before, a motet by Bach, uh, the words in German, but I knew enough German to know what I was singing at the time I sang it. But later on, after my, com my conversion, I realized the words, the Spirit also helps us, for we know not how we ought to pray, <laughs> came from Romans chapter 8. Yeah. And, and they, of course, had the words had new meaning for yeah. me after Before you that. were just saying them. Right. Just saying them. right. And actually that happens to a lot of people brought up in, especially I think in liturgical mm -hmm. worship, that they can say it, they can learn it, they can mm -hmm. memorize it, spout it off, but it doesn't hit here mm -hmm. until that work of grace mm -hmm. opens their heart. And so our work as parents and as educators is to do everything we can to open the channel so the grace can bring that alive. Right. What was it then that... Uh, that drew you away from now your evangelicalism to start considering the Catholic faith? Well, interestingly, Marcus, <laughs> <laughs> I was actually attracted to the Catholic Church from the time I was a young child, mm. off and on. I remember, you know, in my grade school days, kind of interested. I had cousins who were Catholic and attended Catholic school, and my father, I knew, had been brought up Catholic. Mm -hmm. So there was something, I guess... What was the interest? Uh, it, it seemed, there was something about it that seemed uh, so... What, what little I knew about it, it seemed so beautiful mm -hmm. and mysterious. And, and because it was so uh, old and mm -hmm. ancient and, uh, and so ongoing, there was, mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to describe, but there was something that attracted me to it. And I knew uh, the Episcopal Church that we went to was what we'd call a low church, and there was a higher church in town. Uh, and, and I thought, well, that's more like a Catholic church. Uh, and for some reason, I, even as a young child, I was interested. And in, so I went through periods of time where I was interested and then fell away. And in high mm -hmm. school, I studied Latin, uh, not just because I liked the classical culture, but because I, just in case I ever became Catholic. <laughs> that's interesting, <laughs> given your background, you even considered that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what happened during those wild years when you were out uh, uh, flaunting with Ed Edgar Casey's teachings? Oh, what happened with music? Well, with or, no, the Catholic faith. Oh, oh, and thinking okay. about that. All right. Well, I um, when I was in Texas, uh, the church I I went to, uh, the Episcopal Church there was directly across the street from the Catholic Church, and uh, at that time. Uh, I was drawn and, and uh, greatly appreciate, I was drawn into the charismatic renewal. There was a prayer group that started across the street at Immaculate Conception Church. And uh, so I, I joined the prayer group and, and I, even though I would never have been attracted to something like that before, it was God's work in my life <laughs> and the joy that the Lord brought me that drew me to, I loved the exuberance of the praise and worship and the fact that praising the Lord in a vocal way draw, leads you to praise Him in your heart. And it's such a wonderful uh, thing. Oh, enter into His gates with thanksgiving yeah. and into His courts with praise. Mm. And I, I just found it to be a great blessing. So I, 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 here I was going to a very high Episcopal church there in Texas on Sunday mornings. We, I loved our, our liturgy and we had... We did uh, the best music we could with our small choir, and uh, and yet and then on Sunday nights I would go and and uh, you know I'd be leading praise and worship at the prayer meetings. That's an interesting uh, uh, dichotomy in some sense. You've got the high Anglican church uh -huh. and the charismatic Catholic. It was a, a, quite a bit different exposure right. to Catholicism. Right. So then it was through that that I got to know a lot of Catholics firsthand, and also some friends. During that time, two or three people I knew joined the Catholic Church. 
So I, I kind of followed them through their mm -hmm. steps. Plus, I was reading at the time, too. Uh, at that time, I reread a book that I had read in high school, The Seven Story Mountain by Thomas Merton. That was another His time that book, I yeah. had been <laughs> attracted to the church. And then I also read uh, Venerable John Henry Newman's uh, Apology of Pro Vita Sua. Uh, and, you know, reading it as an Anglican, um, you know, yeah. I, I really, what I really appreciated about him was that he had that interior conversion uh, as a young boy of 16, teenager, and then he, you know, was drawn to, through the Oxford movement to the more Catholic, mm -hmm. um, shall we say, way of the Catholic roots of Anglicanism, but then he was logically drawn into the Catholic Church after reading the Fathers and comparing uh, the historical church with the 39 articles of the Church of England. And, but it was still quite a few years after I read that before I entered the Catholic Church. Did you have to deal with any of the, did you have any, uh, any bias against the Catholic Church? You had to work through any prejudices in your own journey? Um, well, you know, they were never, uh, there were some. I was, of course, a little concerned about, like many Protestants are, uh, about things like, uh, well, purgatory a little bit, excuse me, never the real presence. I never mm -hmm. had a problem with that, or the Pope, uh, but maybe Mary and the saints, and mm -hmm. how are they, do, we, do, do Catholics really pray to the saints? And, mm -hmm. But I got to understand that better, and appreciated it, and, and then have experienced the fruits of that in my life since then. Well, the Lord has used music in your life, mm -hmm. many, many ways. Uh, and now as a professor of music, teaching music and leading uh, music. Talk, let's talk about music in its place in our faith. Uh, let's talk in general, first of all, about the history of music in the Christian movement, in the Catholic Church, in our faith. Yeah. Give the audience a little bit of background right. for its place. Well, in about 2,000 years in Digest for <laughs> uh, Even before that, because right. you're gaining talking about <laughs> singing a new song, right, in the right, song. Right, right. Okay. I teach a course at Franciscan University called Heritage of Sacred Music, and we go right back to the Jewish roots, uh, and then we talk about the early Christians, and um, of course the first Christians were, were Jews originally, right. and uh, uh, so there's speculation, you know, they sang the Psalms, St. Paul, as you know, talks about Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and the, the, uh, the fathers um, write some about music, uh, mainly to attack uh, instrumental music, hmm. uh, and because it was used in uh, pagan situations uh, for at banquets uh, where meat was sacrificed to idols. So there was always that controversy about the place of right, musical instruments. Right, in and then uh, you know the chant that grew out of the worship in the, in the in hmm. the liturgy, both in the mass and in the liturgy of the hours. There was always singing and chanting and. And it grows out of the Jewish tradition, too, the fact that the Mass was chanted. The Jews felt that uh, it was t God was too sacred to simply to speak about, so they chanted. And that idea carried over, too, into early Christian worship and through the centuries. Um, and You had broken down earlier into three different... Oh, yes. There's a, uh, a history of Catholic church music in which the writer breaks the history of Catholic church music into three periods, music as worship, music for worship, and music at worship. And the first period he sees as the early part of the church up through about 1300. And so that would really encompass the early chant, Gregorian chant, which grew right out of the liturgy because it's the whole liturgy as chanted, as sung. And uh, it, that really elevates the level of the worship when the priest chants and the people chant back. The second period would be when polyphony came along, and that would be polyphony as many voices. It would be singing in parts. Hmm. Um, and at that point, then, the earliest polyphony was really an, an embellishment of the chant, and gradually the chant got hidden under hmm. the polyphony, and so music became more and more complicated, still beautiful. So music for worship is the period that goes from about 1300 to about 1600. And at the end of that period, you have composers like Palestrina, who's considered to be 
sort of the, the apex of Catholic church music. Mm -hmm. And this was music that was definitely composed to glorify God and composed for use in the liturgy, but it wasn't as connected to mm -hmm. the liturgy. Uh, Meaning that could be pulled chant. out of the liturgy and sung. It could be. On its own, Plus, it's still sung more connected by to the choir rather okay. than by the people. Uh, hmm. And but still, it it was uh, something that was really connected to the liturgy. The third hmm. period, from about 1600 to our present day, music music at worship signifies that music is more used was used more as an embellishment to worship, and that people hmm. sing at mass rather than singing the mass. Um, that's a, perhaps an oversimplification, but it does um, give you an idea. When you look at the type of music that was composed in each of those periods, you can see that that fits pretty well. What about the development of the hymn as we know it, um, where you chorus, refrain, and mm -hmm. then about five choruses? Okay. Now, originally in the Catholic Church, the hymn was originally associated, well, by about the fourth century, Hymns were, or the 400s, hymns were associated mainly with what we today call the Liturgy of the Hours, the okay. Divine Office, and they weren't really a part of Mass. Oh, interesting. Uh, okay. huh. But there were hundreds of hymns that were composed hmm. for, for the Divine Office. Now, hmm. at certain points in history, particularly after the Reformation in Germany, German hymns were sometimes introduced at Mass uh, par in parallel uh, situations with the parts of the Liturgy. So, for instance, at the offertory, if an offertory chant, Gregorian chant, was sung, then a hymn might be sung in German uh, or whatever country it was uh, that would parallel mm -hmm. the the words of the chant, because the chant was a word that w it was a chant that was mm -hmm. proper to that day, which brought out the theme for that mass that day, mm -hmm. and so. So the hymn would do that, but by and large, uh, hymns at Mass, I think, really came along mm, before Vatican II at, with the Low Mass, uh, which was a spoken Mass, uh, which would have hymns with it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then since Vatican II, more and more hymns have been introduced In right within Mass. mass. It's, a, it's kind of a hybrid uh, right? type of Mass. Uh, and so a lot of the hymns we sing today, are some are of Catholic origin, but many come from different Protestant origins, um, some from, oh, you know, uh, Methodist or Anglican or Lutheran or other backgrounds. And truly backgrounds. The, the movement of the Spirit in these beautiful hymns. It's, yeah, I think now, uh, I mean, since certainly the Adoramus Hymnal uh, included a, a, a good body of hymns But you had a part to do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure the audience realized. Part. I didn't mention it earlier, but you uh, were one of the editors of the Adoramus Hymnal, which is the hymnal used here uh, at the, the chapel here at EWTN. Uh, but it's a wonderful uh, collection of hymns. It, is it true what so many believe that the reason for the use of art, statues, and music throughout the history of the church was because the average person out there couldn't read or write, couldn't read the gospel, couldn't read the Bible, and so this was their main way of learning the teachings of the church. I would say that that's partly true, but that's only just a little part of it. I think more important than that is the fact that art and music are a kind of catechism through the senses. Um, no matter how educated we are, whether we've just gone through grade school or if we have a postgraduate degree, they affect us in ways that we, in, and at levels that we don't know rationally, and draw us towards the Lord and teach us uh, through the senses. And, and I think that that was um, an important part of all of the beautiful art, Western art, that is, comes right from the Mass. You know, the, it's the, the origin of Western culture. So it wasn't merely a matter of people being illiterate, but also a kind of a, a catechism through our senses. There was a book published a couple of years ago. Uh, what is it? Why Catholics Can't Sing? Or right. I forget how it goes. Why in. Catholics Can't Sing. Yes. Ta yeah. What was the author talking about? Why was he addressing a book to that issue? That, All right. I mean, maybe the audience recognizes that no, we Catholics aren't known for our singing the way our Protestant brothers and sisters are. Right. Why don't well, we Thomas sing Day. It? Thomas okay. Day wrote the book, and <clears throat> and um, his point in the book. Uh, one of the reasons he wrote the book was that 
after Vatican II that was going to revolutionize the way Catholics worship and Catholics were going to be singing just like Protestants and it, while it is true I think that Catholics do sing more it, although I was I became a Catholic after Vatican II so <laughs> I, I I can't tell you for sure uh, but although I, uh, I think they do sing more now than they used to still it's amazing how few Catholics do sing at Mass and his so he went into the roots of that, and he, one of the reasons he put forth was, uh, and I'm of Irish background, half Irish, <laughs> he said that um, in the United States, the role of the Irish have been, has been very important in the church, uh, and that the Irish had a tradition of not singing because of the fact that for so many years they were under persecution yeah. by the English, and they had to hold Mass in secret so they made a virtue out of not singing at Mass, and so they didn't have that tradition of singing. Unlike Germans, uh, Poles, Italians, and maybe some other uh, European nations, and so that that was part of the reason. The s next reason he gives is that so many of the melodies, uh, first of all, that the Irish liked were sentimental ballads, which were not really meant to be sung by ordinary people, but more soloists, and then he he feels that some of the music that has come out since Vatican II is of that type, oh, that it's actually pretty difficult to sing, mm -hmm. even though it's in a sort of a modern sort of popular idiom and, and in English. Um, talk a bit about the, uh, the importance of prayer for our own, importance of music for our own prayer life. Uh, it, it was a chant was a part of mm -hmm. chanting the psalms. We mm -hmm. chanted together in in liturgy. What mm -hmm. about our own prayer lives? In personal prayer? Yeah. Okay. I, well, I would say you know for your personal prayer life that that I, th I think music could play a big. The reason part. I say that is the daily office right. has that as a part of right. it. Right. You it? could definitely sing a hymn. You could chant the psalms. Um, you can, in fact, I teach uh, the psalm, Gregorian psalm tones to my students in English, and teach, I teach them how to set the text in English and in Latin. And uh, and there are other other music you could use, you know, praise and worship songs. Or, but uh, Gregorian chant for chanting the psalms. There's such a beauty uh, and the regularity, the rhythm of the psalm tones. The tone is a melodic formula. To, for those who don't know. Uh, to which you set the words, and the tone is used for every single verse of the psalm. So there's a, a kind of a, yeah. a repetition, a beautiful rhythm of it, and especially when you chant with others. Yeah. Chanting by yourself would be wonderful, but not quite as good as doing it, doing it with others. We're going to take a break just a second, but I knew there was something else I was going to ask from something you mentioned earlier. You mentioned the Vatican II mm -hmm. and its changes or its call for changes, mm -hmm. but something you mentioned to me earlier today I thought was important. The footnotes mm -hmm. in the documents. Often people will misinterpret the writings of Vatican II as if everything that's come before mm -hmm. is now defunct and that we now look from here onward with a whole new way of looking at it. But the footnotes are important, aren't they? Right, right. We were talking about the mm -hmm. references to, to right. popes you, that have written about the music. Right. If you uh, look at chapter 6, which is on sacred music in the Constitution on the Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, uh, you'll see that almost everything that is written about music in there uh, is footnoted, and you'll see that there's an earlier document. And the 20th century, I don't think there's been any century where the popes and the church have written more on sacred music than in our own century, mm -hmm. starting in 1903 with Pope St. Pius X, who uh, was trying to reform church music and promote Gregorian chant and also to restore it to the people. Mm. Uh, many people think that Vatican II was the first time that active participation was mentioned, but Pope St. Pius X was the one who actually said, let the chant be restored to the people so mm. that they may be, raise their voices in song once more as they did in days of old and that, that the people should know their parts of the Mass in chant. And so that's repeated, and also his three qualities of sacred music are again repeated in the document. Uh, the three qualities are holiness, goodness of form, which means artistic quality, and third, universality. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Let's take a, a break. Maybe we'll come back with some of your questions about these issues about okay. the music. 
and other issues of your own journey. So please join us in just a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest this evening is Dr. Susan Tracy. She talked about her journey of faith, her adult conversion to Jesus Christ, and then how in her following of that, uh, through the influence of friends and reading and, and uh, the work of the Spirit in your heart, you were drawn home to the Catholic Church. And then you were talking about the place of music in uh, your own journey of faith, but also in liturgy and in prayer and the history of the Church. You ended just before the break on... St. Pius X's uh, three qualities of sacred music. Could you go into that a little more? Yes, um, he lists three qualities of sacred music and then he actually explains them a little bit. The first is holiness. In other words, sacred music should have a quality of holiness and that nothing that will associate it with something that's secular or profane. Um, mm. The second quality is goodness of form and by that he means music of high artistic quality. And thirdly, universality, he says that the universal quality grows out of the first two qualities. And under that, he says that it's music that uh, anyone around the world could hear and know that it was holy, mm. artistic, Catholic music. He does say that various cultures around the world can uh, incorporate uh, some aspect of their own culture, but not so that it detracts from the universality of the faith. Um, and then his, what he says is echoed by Pope Pius XI uh, just 25 years later in another document, Divini Cultus, and then Pope Pius XII in his uh, encyclical on the liturgy of 1947 and his writings on sacred music of 1955 and another document in 1958. Okay. So, so we have a long tradition. Really. Now, that, it's interesting in that idea of producing music in one culture that isn't offensive in another. Mm -hmm. And that's not always easy because mm -hmm. uh, music, African music uh, brought into our own culture mm -hmm. links with other music in our culture that we may not think is holy, mm -hmm. or in their culture it may be holy, or music that, let's say, comes out of the Spanish tradition, let's say, a Mexican mm -hmm. tradition coming into ours, or let's mm -hmm. say we're going to Japan. Yeah. Now, how, how do you make that transition? Well, you know, it's interesting you should mention, for instance, the Spanish tradition, and maybe perhaps African as well. In the uh, 16th century, when the Spanish uh, came to the New World and colonized, uh, in New Spain, they taught the Aztecs how to sing Gregorian chant mm -hmm. and, and poly polyphony, choral music, and many of them, they taught them how to compose. I've actually mm -hmm. sung choral music by native born Mexican composers of the early 1600s, which uh, resembles very much the music of Palestrina or Victoria. Mm -hmm. And so, and it was written that, that people marveled at how beautifully they did it, in too. In the movie The Mission, in the movie The mm -hmm. Mission, I think they portray that with one of the Jesuit missionaries. It's been so long since I've seen that movie, I'd like yeah. to see it again. And all I, those little children yeah. singing Gregorian chant. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the beauty of that. Yeah. Of course, it was misinterpreted, too, by right. others who were seeing it as a destruction of their own culture rather than seeing an enrichment of yeah, the culture that they had. Yeah, but that's a very rather uh, limited view because also yeah. at the same time, they composed carols in their own language yeah. and they composed, a, there was a variety of music that they composed, but, but the music that I was talking about was strictly liturgical mm -hmm. music. Well, sadly, history is often only told from one side. Right. You don't get the whole yeah. picture. You know. Let's take our first email. This comes from Kevin. Dear Marcus and Dr. Tracy, as a Catholic, I am often disappointed with the music at Mass. Can you recommend specific hymnals and how to increase participation? My wife is Presbyterian, and the Presbyterian hymnal contains such classic hymns as How Great Thou Art, etc. I also like the Glory Patri and Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. What classical Protestant hymns can be incorporated into the Mass? 
And why are so many Protestant churches moving towards the emotion-driven choruses like, our God is an awesome God? He's got a bunch of questions yeah. in there. Okay. You want me to go back and review them a bit? First of all, recommend specific hymnals and how to increase mm -hmm. participation is one. Second of all, um, what classical Protestant hymns can be incorporated into the Mass? And then thirdly, why are so many Protestant churches moving toward these emotion-driven hymns like, mm -hmm. our God is an mm -hmm. awesome God? Well, um, First of all, I assume that, Kevin, you mean uh, Catholic hymnals uh, <laughs> when you recommend, say, recommend a hymnal. Uh, currently, I would recommend the Outer Amos hymnal. You were, talk and, about getting involved with that yeah, and, and the thoughts behind that. Hymnal. Right. And uh, one of the other editors is in the audience tonight, uh -huh. actually, my colleague, Calvert Shank. And Dr. Kurt Potterack uh, was the main editor. and. Um, we wanted to, and Father Fessio was really behind it all, and, and um, Helen Hitchcock also played a big part. We wanted to produce, uh, at least at first, a small hymnal which has the entire Mass, the text of the Mass, in both English and Latin, with the chants and responses that people should uh, w can know, and so they can totally participate at Mass. It also contains about four or five different settings of the mass parts, what we call the ordinary, the unchanging parts, like the Kyrie, the Gloria, etc., in Latin, in Gregorian chant, and in English. There are about four or five settings, mm -hmm. modern settings in English. Settings meaning different tunes. Different yeah. tunes, yeah. right. And, and then lastly, we included 160 classic hymns, many of which are from Protestant traditions, um, hymns like for all the saints, which mm -hmm. comes from the Anglican Great. tradition. Uh, oh, uh, right now, you know, being faced here on television, my, <laughs> my memory is going. But but uh, great classic hymns. They, they, they're really, and uh, in the original, with the original lyrics, no changing the lyrics, uh, either for modernization, modernization or for inclusive language. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but now, how do you? Uh, how, and oh, the price is reasonable too. Uh, <laughs> how do you introduce them to your congregation? I, w I can only answer from my personal experience uh, from the choir I direct at Franciscan University. Um, I always provide a leaflet for the congregation which invites them to join in. It lists the page numbers for everything and if the responsorial psalm includes the music or anything that's not in the hymnal that's in the pews and then at the beginning of the mass i or someone gets else gets up and we invite the congregation to join in with the singing and encourage them to join in and and if you also if you don't do too many new things all the time then that also helps but but i think just being invited week after week will really help them to join in Let's take a, we have a phone caller, and then I, I may want to go back to this other okay. question that, that uh, the emailer had. This is uh, Mildred. Hello, Mildred. What's your question for us tonight? Uh, well, uh, I, I wanted to talk with you. Thank you for the, bringing us this program every week, Marcus. Um, it, it must be very hard for a, uh, uh, for a doctor. Uh, I'm sorry, the name of the doctor. Dr. Um, Tracy. Uh, well, I'm, I'm uh, 85 years old, and I've uh, been a captive for all my life. And I seldom, if ever, have heard good music. And I just don't know how anyone can come from the Protestant tradition where there is, in most cases, such beautiful music and listen to the stuff we have Sunday after Sunday. Thanks, Mildred. I think a lot of people do feel that way. Uh -huh. There's different opinions on that. Uh, talk a bit about uh, the Episcopal tradition that you came from and, and the I've heard many Anglican converts have talked about the beauty of the Episcopal mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on it? Well, that's, that's a difficult one to talk about, really. Uh, it's true that the liturgy in the Episcopal Church, you know, they've been doing liturgy in English for 400 years. And uh, so... It's a little and, bit of the Elizabethan flavor to it. Right. Too, it Although since the 1970s, some more modern touches have been introduced. Um, but Episcopalians are used to singing hymns. They like to sing all the stanzas. And um, they just have had, I guess, a sense of, of what... Well, their starting out in the vernacular occurred a long time ago. 
And I think that in the Catholic Church, well, there was some awful music before Vatican II, to be sure. But since Vatican II, it happened to coincide with the 60s, and which was a time when people threw out a lot of what they had treasured and cherished before and thought they were doing something new that was going to be relevant. And uh, so I think in, in many cases, intentions were good, but they, I would say they were uncatechized, to use a, a good Catholic word, uh, as to really what the Catholic Church has always had as an ideal for music. Um, but really, you know, it's not just something since Vatican II. The reason why Pope St. Pius X wrote his document in 1903, 1903 was because there were abuses occurring back then. A secular style of music, uh, then it was more operatic music and sort of sentimental ballads were being sung very often in churches and and the Pope wanted to bring back the pure Gregorian chant, restore holy music. And and so things seem to go in cycles mm -hmm. in a way, uh, really. And, and so I think uh, after Vatican II, it was part of the general ferment in society which allowed some of this music to be introduced. Um, that's mm -hmm. about all I can say here, really, although I think that uh, and this also may go back to Kevin's question, too, that I think that people, in some ways, people have gotten used to that, uh, what we have now. In other ways, people like yourself, Mildred, are dissatisfied. And I think if you can get more, more musicians educated and have them gradually educate the congregation and little by little introduce music that is easy to sing but still worthy, uh, yeah. you can gradually effect a change. You mentioned earlier about how the it's Irish immigrants coming from uh -huh. their background and which because of their persecution brought with them uh, a hesitancy to sing out. And I think the, the flip side is true for uh, the Anglican and Episcopalian background at a time in England in the 17th century uh, when uh, it was uh, against the 16th and 17th century was against the law to be Catholic. There was recusants, you know, the Catholics right, that had to stay right. underground to survive, mm -hmm. uh, couldn't let anyone know they were Catholics. But to show your loyalty to the church of the country, you s took a stand, you sang out. Uh, that was your way of professing, was to boldly sing out. Uh, and you were, a you were a part of the party by your singing out. I think that In helped. church? Yes. Okay. I mean, you were, instead of hiding... You were coming out of the closet in your Catholicism. Uh -huh. If if you gave in to the Anglican, and there you were. Now you were part of the church, and you were singing and boldly out. It was like making a profession of loyalty to the government. And I have a feeling that was part of the background that led to the bold singing in England. Versus, so many Catholics in this country came from persecuted lands. To be a Catholic, nobody could survive as a Catholic in England was to not talk about it. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, it was a terrible period. This remaining question from this one email, if you would address this. Why are so many Protestant churches, and in even some sense some of our modern Catholic mu music, moving towards the emotion-driven choruses? Oh, okay. You know, there was a really interesting article in the New Oxford Review just this month about that very question, uh, emotionalism and I know Ronald Knox, the convert, talked also about that issue. Yeah. About it's such a temptation often to be driven right. in that direction, be pulled in that direction, because it almost seems like a more fulfilling experience right. because it drives our emotions. Right, it does. And I'll have to say it is very, um, it is very fulfilling in lots of ways. But uh, the article made the point, I think it was by a, guy, a man named David Hill, but in, that in Catholic worship, it's more for the everyday situations mm. where your your emotions go deeper. Uh, it's it's not the you're not on the mountaintop. You can't be on the mountaintop of emotion all the time, yeah. and um, mm. and so Catholic worship is more everyday, but its roots go deeper, and and that's it has staying power really. 
Let's take our next caller. This is Marilyn. Hello, Marilyn. What's your question this evening? Hi. I wanted to go back to the issue of Edgar Casey that you were talking yes. about earlier. <laughs> um, me and my husband are uh, we're in the RCIA program, and we also studied the Edgar Casey teachings before we started um, deciding to become Catholic. Mm -hmm. And our big uh, obstacle has been Edgar Casey and the issue of reincarnation. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, you mentioned that there was a pamphlet or some people you mm -hmm. met who had told you something that helped you to overcome that obstacle. And I was wondering, what did they say to help you uh, get to the point where you uh, could let that go and, and feel that he wasn't a credible source? Thank you, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. I would guess I would have to say that was just the Holy Spirit. Because when I first read that booklet, I, remember, I annotated in the margins. I was not convinced by what the booklet said. It was later on, I just came to just, I simply came to accept the truth through God's grace. And, and now as time goes on, I see that with reincarnation, uh, at first it was appealing because it seemed like you got a second chance, or a third, or a fourth, or a fifth. <laughs> but I think that would be terrible to have to come back again and again mm -hmm. when our striving in our life is to see the Lord and to be with Him in heaven and 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 the Bible says we're only given one life to live the the reality of groups like the Edgar Casey and and other groups is as Catholics we recognize uh, the reality of the supernatural and the need to discern who it is that we're hearing um, and when you get apart from the church and you don't have the, the discernment of the church to help you decide, are you hearing from God? Are you hearing from the devil? Mm. Then you don't know. And it's very possible that someone could be being channeled by uh, a spirit uh, that is making them sound very, very believable and saying all kinds of things that sound fantastic. But is it of the Lord? Mm -hmm. And that's the issue. The pamphlet, that I had that very pamphlet uh, in my file. Okay. InterVarsity Press, I can't uh -huh. remember the author. But... It is available, I'm sure, you, through the Internet. You can find that. You might also call Catholic Answers in California. Mm. They have a website, www.catholic.com, and ask them that question because I'm sure they have information. I'm sorry that we don't have it. It's readily available mm. here on the live program. But uh, <clears throat> if you were to call back in or send an email, I'm sure someone here could send you some information. Let's take another call. This is Joe. Hello. What's your question for us tonight? Yeah, this is... <clears throat> Hello, this... Hello, Joe. Hello, this is Joe. Uh, I got a question to ask you. I've been singing in the, they invited me to sing here in this church about 200 feet from my house, and I never, I, I went ahead and seen the people that were singing, and I liked the way they sing. And then I asked, because I'm still a Catholic, right? So then I asked the Catholic priest that if I could sing in church. And he said, yes, he let me sing once, but when I went and asked him again, he said that he needs to talk to the, the higher priest so I can, uh, what do you call it? Uh, in other words, so I could sing in the Catholic Church. Yes. So, uh, so uh, is it okay for some person to go and sing up front, or do you have to sing with all the choir? Oh, so the question is, is a person as a, a cantor? Is is that what he's talking Joe, about? Joe, are you saying you would be a cantor at your church, where you would go up front and lead the people in song? Uh huh. Yeah, is that there are many that do that, right? That's and something that's done a lot today. I know a lot of a lot of parishes have cantors to help lead the singing. Especially um, I'm in not the psalm. The, yeah, especially the psalm, the responsorial psalm. Is that what you're asking? I, I don't think he's on okay. the phone anymore. Is that a, a, a long-standing tradition? I'm new to the church myself. Uh, so. I don't think so, actually. Okay. I, 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 that's something I actually not studied uh, or looked into myself, but I don't think it's a, a very long tradition in the, in the Catholic Church. The um, singing of that particular song. Or, or being a cantor, a cantor having a okay. cantor up front uh, leading. Oh, up in front as opposed to in back or a choir right. leading the, uh, the congregation. Usually the, congreg the choir uh, before uh, normally was in the back. A okay. lay choir made up of lay people would be in, in the back. Here's an email. We'll take this one from Tom. It'll get you in trouble. Dear Marks and Dr. Tracy, how do you feel about folk music, e.g. guitars at Mass? Thanks, Tom. Well, <laughs> actually, I play guitar myself, 
and I, I play, I've played it many times, uh, you know, outside of Mass, but very seldom at Mass, and although I occasionally enjoy it, and especially when, if I go to a Mass that it's not in an old, traditional looking church, you know, if the Mass is in a, a building like a gym, or a, a building that looks kind of... Like a uh, conference, or... Like a conference, something like that then I could enjoy it, but it seems out kind of to me out of place in a more traditional looking church. And the guitar is not really associated historically with hmm. sacred music. Um, so I guess that's all I can Isn't say. Isn't the organ that. specifically mentioned in the, the Vatican II documents? The organ is specifically mentioned uh, in, the, in the Vatican II documents. Um, and it says other instruments will, may also be used provided they are in keeping with the spirit of the liturgical celebration. Here's a great email. Um, I have often heard that singing songs of praise to God is like praying twice. Where does oh, that come from? And, and comment on that, if you will. Okay. Now, sometimes people say that St. Augustine said it, and I'm not sure. Some people say they're not sure who said it, but, okay. but I would say that's true. Uh, there's something elevating about singing it raises it above the normal everyday level of speech. And as I mentioned earlier, in Jewish times, they felt that God's name, of course we know that God's name was too sacred to be spoken, but also in their worship, it was too sacred simply to be spoken, but should have been sung, should be sung. Here's a, here's a good email right up your line from Laura Ringsmuth. Dear Susan, our daughter loves music and would like to make it a career in her life. As parents, we would love like to send her to a college that offers a major in music. Can you recommend a Catholic university or college that believes that music is an important part of our spiritual lives and essential to our church worship? Okay. Well, you know, there aren't... Uh, that has a music major. Okay. Um, I don't really know that well about the various music programs that are offered in Catholic colleges. Uh, at Franciscan University, we don't have a music major yet. Now, the University of Notre Dame has a music major. Um, Would you say in a sense that across the board that there's a dearth today of good music programs? There? In the Catholic context, I would mm. say there needs to be more. Catholic colleges and schools, elementary and high schools, very seldom offer music. It's, it's definitely a dearth. They don't realize the great part that music has in our Christian lives. Hmm. Well, you've, you've brought a little bit of that to us. With the two minutes remaining, uh, you've made us appreciate some of that in our mm -hmm. own lives. And I, I'm thinking of a psalm that, where David is saying, uh, uh, Praise the Lord, O my soul. And it's as if he's speaking to himself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Telling himself to praise God because of that spiritual battle within us. And that one question about how music helps us pray twice mm -hmm. is a way of opening our soul to God. Mm -hmm. It's a channel mm -hmm. of our heart. Uh, with a couple minutes uh, minutes remaining, talk a bit about how becoming a Catholic helped you grow in your relationship with Christ. Okay, well, first of all, uh, just the vast ocean, the richness of the church uh, her spiritual patrimony, uh, the church fathers, boy, when I read some of the patristic writers, they are, they're just so deep, they're so joyful and so, uh, so close to the Lord, both chronologically and spiritually. Also, musically, uh, I just, since having the opportunity to direct the Scola Cantorum at the university, I've It's grown, a Latin choir. Yeah, we do things in English too, but we mostly do Gregorian chant and and a cappella choral music. And uh, even though I know, knew a lot of this music before, I know more and more of it now, and I've grown to love it so much more. It's such a beautiful way of praying. And just the, uh, s just the wealth of, of the spiritual life, the whole system of life, the whole support, uh, both in church writings and in our brothers and sisters, the saints in heaven, mm -hmm. just the whole, everything is just marvelous. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much Thanks, for joining. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, thank you. It's been a long time coming. We wanted to have you here and, and also to remind us of the beauty of music in our heritage so that we don't take it for granted.
Right. You don't just sing the words. We've got to listen right. to what they say and offer them up as a worship to our Lord. So thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you for joining us. God bless. See you again next week on A Journey Home. Thank you.